So now we have uh, Catherine Zurek, new approaches in flat space solography and observational signatures. invitation to give this talk. So this is a program of research that's about five years old. And um, there's an extensive now line of reasoning associated with it. And I have about 25 minutes to explain it to you. So I'm not going to go into any technical detail at all. So this will be a, basically almost a colloquium level summary. And um, I will refer you to these papers for details, but I at least want to give you the picture of why we're thinking about the sets of things that we are. Okay, so um, as you've all known from childhood, uh, <laughs> we don't normally think about observational signatures of quantum gravity, uh, essentially because of Wilsonian effective field theory reasoning which says that uh, quantum gravity effects should only be visible at very short time and distance scales. And that any effects of quantum gravity should decouple in the infrared. Uh, and standard effective field theory calculations where you compute loops, for example, as we saw you know, earlier by Woodard, you'll see corrections at loop level that go like power to g newton, maybe with some IR logarithms. But generally speaking, this type of intuition, physical intuition, holds up under uh, standard kinds of calculations. However, we also know that there have been puzzles that we have really struggled to resolve within the context of local effective field theory when applied to gravity. And the context in which this is most sharp is the black hole information problem. And as we heard this morning from Jan, I think it is generally under that the resolution to the black hole information problem lies in non-locality, where the naive effective field theory seems to break down and UV effects may not, in fact, decouple in the infrared. So one of the things that plays uh, a central role in all of these ideas, thinking about black hole horizons, which are often the focus of research, uh, is the notion of the thermodynamic entropy of black holes, that the entropy of the black hole scales as the area of its horizon. And the modern understanding of this is that we should think of that information, actually technically in an information theoretic sense, as counting the amount of the number of bits within the system, that the number of bits within the system just scales with the area. And that's one sense in which you can understand holography. Now, I'm not actually interested in black hole horizons, but I do want to say just uh, one more thing about them, about why, from the perspective of black holes, you might expect that the infrared scale appears. And we'll just do a little thought experiment that's actually due to Merrill nearly 20 years ago. So let's suppose that we take this idea seriously, that the area of the black hole is the number of bits that those bits can fluctuate thermodynamically. So I quite literally just take a qubit system with an area's worth of degrees of freedom. Each one of those degrees of freedom is gonna have a temperature that's just set by the size of the black hole, which is just R. And now what I do is to allow all of those little bits to fluctuate independently. And then I compute how much the mass of the black hole fluctuates due to all these little bits having these thermodynamic fluctuations. And then I do a classical calculation, and I compute the back reaction on the mass fluctuation of the black hole. And perhaps not surprisingly, what happens is that not only the UV scale enters, the Planck length, but also the IR scale. Okay, and in fact, it goes like the geometric mean of those in four dimensions. There's a, a more general relation that one can write down. At least naively, this would be unobservably small in the context of a black hole horizon. However, one way that you can understand this result is simply in terms of quantum Brownian motion. So uh, when I have 
you know, a bunch of molecules, and I let them spread, this results that it depends on both the UV and the IR scale can be understood as I start with the particle at some initial point, I let it random walk, the typical time scale for the interaction is set by some UV scale, and then I let it evolve. And the uncertainty in the position of that particle is going to depend both on the UV and the IR scale, which is to say the typical length scale for the interaction as well as the observing time. Okay. So that's exactly consistent with this scaling that comes out of black hole horizons. And if you look under the hood at the details of it, that's actually not an accident. It works out in a higher number of dimensions as well. Okay. So you might say, okay, I'm actually interested in laboratory measurements. Okay. There's no flu hydrodynamic fluid. It's just flat, empty space. What does this picture have to do with some uh, reasonable theory of quantum gravity? And what I'm going to argue is that there are a lot of detailed technical reasons to believe that just like black holes, volumes of empty space have, a have an entropy associated with them. And I can associate uh, thermodynamic fluctuations with those horizons. And I can measure those thermodynamic fluctuations associated with quantum gravity by making very precise measurements of space-time, such as you would do with an interferometer. Okay. So the big picture idea here is that certain physics at horizons has universal characteristics. And in particular, this certain physics I'm going to focus on is a zeroth order thing that the information of quantum gravity is encapsulated, at least at the coarse-grained level, and the number of degrees of freedom uh, on the area which bound the volume. So you have a black hole horizon, okay, where there, there are gravitational degrees of freedom, which is given by the area of that black hole horizon. But what I'm going to tell you about next is that I can also think about a measurement in a laboratory as defining a horizon. Okay. So let me tell you about how that works. So let's think about uh, just sending a light beam out to a mirror and having it come back. So this is a typical interferometer. These are the world lines of the mirrors. And as the light beam goes out and comes back, what it does is to define a causal diamond. So one way you can think about it is a measurement actually div divides up space-time into subsystems. There's a region of space-time that I measure a region of space-time that I, I don't, and therefore, my measure, in my measurement of the gravitational system, I necessarily lose information. And that loss of information is gravitational radiation, and the space-time back reacts on that loss of information. So we want to understand how much quantum fuzziness is induced in space-time from the fact that I'm only measuring a gravitational subsystem. So you can make this map precise. One nice uh, sandbox for doing this is an ADS CFT, although I should emphasize that I don't think any of these results are specific to ADS CFT. I think they're very generic for quantum gravity. That there is a black hole empty causal diamond dictionary. So on the black hole side, the horizon is, as we just said, now replaced in the causal diamond with the horizon defined by null rays. The black hole temperature, the corresponding thing on the causal diamond side, size is the size of the causal diamond. The analog of the black hole mass is the fluctuation in the uh, energy within that volume. Okay, it's just a vacuum fluctuation. In the context of ADS-CFT, this is more precisely, can be more precisely calculated as the modular fluctuation. And the modular fluctuation in the context of ADS-CFT or the modular Hamiltonian is the thing that defines the partition function. So you can write the partition function in terms of the modular Hamiltonian. And the thermodynamic entropy on the causal diamond side now is just computed through the expectation value of this modular Hamiltonian. 
And in ADS CFT for Ryu Taki and Agi diamonds, you can just show that it's A on 4G. So this correspondence can be made precise. So what's the implication of this? So let's follow this through a little bit more carefully. As long as we are interested in only the part of space-time which is within the causal diamond, which is to say the part of the causal diamond that you can actually measure in your experiment. In that case, the metric in common space-times, this includes Minkowski space, this includes ADS, can be mapped to a metric which is a, what's known as a topological black hole. So what that means is, so if I'm working, for example, in four dimensions, I have light cone coordinates U and V and transverse coordinates Y. There is a transformation that takes me from this standard metric to a form. Now, I didn't write down what the transformation was between U and V and T and R. You can find it in this paper. But the form of it looks just like a black hole. With a blackening factor now, that if uh, in the absence of perturbations, this phi is zero and just goes linearly in the case of Minkowski space is one minus this coordinate. Now I've called the size of the causal diamond capital L. Okay, there's an anal analogous uh, transformation that you can write down for ADS. So that's the first thing to know. Now let's follow our uh, dictionary through. Again, this can be made precise in the context of ADS CFT. Let's take the number of holographic degrees of freedom to be the entropy, okay? It's uh, gonna scale like the area divided by the Planck length squared. And each degree of freedom now for that topological black hole metric that I just wrote down has a temperature that's also set by the, uh, in this case, the arm length or the volume of space time that's being measured with a factor of four pi. Now you just uh, invoke this stochastic argument, okay, which is the back of the envelope version of what you would get from doing it more precisely with the partition function. And you say, okay, the energy fluctuation or the mass fluctuation, the mass fluctuation of the black hole just goes like the square root of the number of degrees of freedom times the temperature of each of those degrees of freedom. And so you actually find that the fluctuation in the mass is Planckian. Now I've had people ask me, well, isn't this already ruled out because the Planck mass is a big number? <laughs> and the answer to that question, because I'll compute the, the uh, back reaction on this, is no. One of the reasons for that is this mass is fluctuating up and down on a time scale, which is the light crossing time. This is not a fixed number. Of course, we're in vacuum. Okay, these are fluctuations. So now I know what the uh, mass fluctuation is in this volume. The corresponding quantity in ADS would be the modular fluctuation. And I compute the uh, back reaction. So now it's a classical calculation. And I apply Newton's law here. And I work out that the gravitational potential is the ratio of the Planck length on L. Now L is the size of the uh, interferometer arm. And by the same metric transformation by which I went from the light cone metric to the topological black hole metric, I can go now from my topological black hole coordinates back to the Minkowski frame. And it turns out that that coordinate transformation is a nonlinear coordinate transformation. So u times v is the thing that scales like one power of r of my topological black hole coordinates. And so when I work that out, this type of uh, metric fluctuation turns into an uncertainty in the time that it takes for my light to go out and come back, which scales again like this geometric mean of L Planck with L, size of my interferometer arm. Okay. So um, if I was giving this talk a few years ago, people would be jumping up and down, shouting at me because of course, we're in empty space, there's no black hole here, but I'm applying black hole thermodynamics or something that's inspired by black hole thermodynamics to this system. So is this justified? And I think the reason why people are questioning this is largely because it goes against your Wilsonian effective field theory intuition. And there are two steps that we need to justify. First of all, 
do horizons in flat empty space have a gravitational entropy associated with them that scales with the area? And do these degrees of freedom have quantum mechanical fluctuations? And I think we've now been able to nail this down quite precisely in a way that I'll tell you about. And I think that we can make a very strong case that the answer to this question is yes. The second question is, does space time respond to these fluctuations in a particular way? Notably, that the response to this, uh, these fluctuations in the modular energy or the analog of them goes quadratically with the light cone coordinates. And I think we have a less decisive proof of this in part because uh, defining gauge invariant observables or calculating them, especially when you have a fluctuating source, uh, is, is, uh, um, is complicated, okay? And we don't yet have a fully local description of this effect. So I'm gonna go into just a little bit of detail on both of these. Okay, so the first postulate. In other words, what are we gonna test in an interferometer if we look for this kind of effect? The first one is that we've been able to show that these fluctuations in the mass or the modular energy is actually equivalent to a fundamental uncertainty in light ray operators that were defined long ago by Tuft in the context of black hole horizons. And we've actually been able to show that those commutation relations are exactly the same as soft commutation relations that people have been studying more recently in the context of celestial holography. So if you write down those commutation relations, what Tuft did was he said, okay, I've got some infalling particle. In his case, he was interested in a black hole horizon. And I've got some outgoing Hawking radiation. And what he asked the question was, if, I, if these, the paths of these two particles cross, I'm gonna cause a shift in the path of one of these particles due to that infall, ingoing particle. And so he computed the shift here called X U and X or X B, depending on whether it's ingoing or outgoing particle, that just depends on the stress tensor of the part ingoing or arc outgoing particle integrated over the appropriate volume. And then what he did was to say, okay, I'm gonna promote these operators now to quantum operators. Here I wrote them down as X plus and X minus, but they're actually just exactly the same as X U and X V. And he said that uncertainty now is just gonna be uh, proportional to the Planck length squared. And what we were able to show in this paper is that if you take this commutation relation now and you apply it to flat empty space, you can show that you uh, derive a relation, which is that the analog of the entanglement entropy just scales like the area. And I don't have time. I was already signaled a few, <laughs> a few minutes ago that I had five minutes left. But the statement that the modular, that the energy fluctuations scale with the area is precisely the same statement as that there's an uncertainty on these light ray operators introduced by a tuft. The second thing that you need to show is that there's an accumulation or memory effect. So if I have a quantum fluctuation in this light ray operator, it's not enough to just have one of these fluctuations because each fluctuation, as you can see from this uncertainty relation, is just Planckian in size. What has to happen is as my light beam is progressing outwards from the beam splitter to the mirror, I have to encounter many of these vacuum fluctuations which are Planckian in size, and then they have to accumulate as a random walk into the infrared. So um, I could say many more things about uh, to what extent we can show that these postulates are reasonable. This first postulate can be derived from celestial soft commutation relations. So if you're not familiar with what those are, this is a program that's been carried on uh, by Andy Strominger and collaborators, where there is a relationship between the news and the shear and we can show that those commutation relations in the context of celestial holography are just identical to the ones that a Tuft wrote down. Okay, so these are things that date all the way back to the time of um, Ashtakar, I believe was the first one who studied them. Okay. 
All right, so I'm going to skip all this because I think I'm out of time. Is that right? Or do I have a few minutes? One. Okay. All right, so um, actually let me say just um, – no, I'm just going to conclude. <laughs> okay, so if this effect is there, you'll have a length fluctuation that goes like the geometric mean of the Planck length with L. Uh, it would be testing these fundamental uncertainty relations and whether they accumulate into the infrared. It's not actually in conflict with LIGO data, uh, but you could um, potentially observe these in a future gravitational wave detector that would be sensitive to uh, high-frequency gravitational waves. So I'll just wrap up there and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Question down there. I wonder, I wonder whether you can use this theoretical uh, technology in order to gain traction on a uh, effect which is predicted, uh, was predicted way back in the 1950s by, um, I think, Pauli uh, called the blurring of the light cone. Mm -hmm. And it should be have yeah. a very distinct uh, signature because if we see even one photon come outside, uh, you know, the causal region, uh, uh, you know, w we've, we've nailed it. Um, can you gain any traction on that? Yeah, so one thing I, I – so I'm not familiar with Pauli's paper, so I don't think that I can con comment in detail on that. But let me just make one comment, which is that uh, gravitational wave detectors usually measure – their standard readout is homodyne readout. They look for a, a shift in the phase of the light front in their experiment. However, you can show that that is actually equivalent to a graviton coming in and actually scattering a photon to a frequency which is set, which, uh, uh, which is offset from the laser by an amount which is the gravitational frequency, which is the frequency of the gravitational wave. So um, that's actually what this experiment is aiming to do, is to look for those photons that are offset from the laser by a frequency which is the size of the interferometer. So that's not exactly the effect that you're talking about, but uh, um, we are, in fact, really going to be looking for uh, photons that have been scattered from vacuum – from gravitons produced by vacuum fluctuations. And, I, you know, I don't know that if I could – so your, the, your other question was, can I think about this effect as a violation uh, – of causality. So we're talking about an effect that I can write down in terms of metric fluctuation. All the calculations that we're doing are – I can write down it down as an effective description where I have a scalar degree of freedom that's quite – you can think of it as a breathing mode. I have these mirrors sitting at some radius from my beam splitter. And then I have an effective degree of freedom, which just sums up all the soft gravitons that are being emitted. And then those mirrors are just fluctuating due to these graviton fluctuations. And um, that's not a violation of causality. <laughs> the theory is still causal. So I don't think that – I don't think you can frame it. Maybe not causal in terms of the uh, outside uh, – Locally causal, but maybe not term not, uh, causal in terms of the uh, uh, average observer. Yeah, that's so right. It's so the metric as is a yeah. quantum variable, and it's uh, it's setting the light cone. And yeah. perhaps it's possible to uh, surf the outward fluctuations of it, like a surfer goes on a wave. Yeah, that's right. So insofar as you can view this as a fuzzing out of the light cone, due to the fundamental uncertainty in space time then yes, you can think about this as an effective violation of causality, even though it's not a fundamental – it's not a local violation of causality. I can calculate it from surfing, but perhaps not enough to say that there is a new change in the fundamental fluctuation. It again – so I, I don't think that question is quite precise enough for me to be able to answer that, but I'm happy to talk more about it. Okay, we'll also have all to postpone all other questions until after the next talk. So thank you again for it.